Coming up, meet Inupiaq musher Ryan Reddington, the winner of this year's Iditarod. Plus, we're joined by the top American men's finisher in the 2023 LA Marathon. And Holly Cook Macaro comments on Navajo water rights, which is a case before the US Supreme Court. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in Washington, D.C., where we're following two major developments from the White House. On Tuesday, President Joe Biden designated two new national monuments located in the Southwest. One of them is Avikwame in Nevada. The news was celebrated by the tribal nations who hold that land with significance, including the Fort Mojave Indian tribe. Chairman Timothy Williams joined the ICT newscast last week to share. Viku May uh, for us Mojave people is the place of our creation, of our existence, and it's that spiritual, spiritual connection uh, that we have. And not only to Fort Mojave Indian tribe, but to several tribes, there's a connection down here um, along the river, along the Colorado River. Williams introduced the president at the Interior Department. Biden declared the proclamation as part of the White House's Conservation and Action Summit, reserving more than 506,000 acres of land. You know, it's a place of reverence, it's a place of spirituality, and it's a place of healing. And now it will be recognized for its significance it holds and be preserved forever. forever. <laughs> With the state of Nevada playing a major role in clean energy projects, the designation of a Viquame National Monument is more prominent. The president has directed the Interior Secretary to manage the monument through the Bureau of Land Management and the National Park Service. Staying at the White House, Indigenous faces were front and center as they were honored with National Humanities Medals on Tuesday. It was the first time Biden gave the award since taking office. The action was delayed because of COVID-19. Cheyenne educator Henrietta Mann was among the recipients. She has been a longtime professor leading various programs across the country devoted to the study of Native history. Mann is a founding president of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Tribal College and has won several Lifetime Achievement Awards. Also receiving the National Humanities Medal is Native America Calling, the live weekday call-in show broadcast on the radio and online has been dubbed the nation's largest electronic talking circle. Native America Calling was first created in 1995 and is now broadcast on 139 main radio stations. The National Humanities Medal is given to individuals and organizations whose work has deepened the nation's engagement with history, literature, and languages. Now to Ecuador, where a national indigenous organization is calling for the resignation of the country's president, Guillermo Lasso. Last week, the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities demanded the immediate departure of the country's president. The group alleges the former banker committed extortion and bribery crimes. Other social organizations are demanding for lawmakers to begin the process to remove him. At a press conference, president of the Confederation, Leonidas Isa said that the country's constitutional court should begin trial proceedings. Exigimos de la Corte Constitucional que apegada a la Constitución de la República pronuncie sobre los requisitos de forma y de paso al juicio político contra el gobierno de Lazo y la Asamblea Nacional proceda con el juicio político y su destitución. Nos autoconvocamos a llevar a cabo plantones ante la Corte Constitucional, la Asamblea Nacional 
exigiendo la admisibilidad del juicio político contra el gobierno de Lazo. After the Constitutional Court reviews impeachment documents, Ecuador's National Assembly could continue the removal process. Now to Phoenix, Arizona, where the 19th annual American Indian Disability Summit is happening this weekend. The theme this year is titled Gathering Native Voices to Learn from the Past, Prepare for the Future. The mission is to provide networking, education, and support for Native people who are disabled and their families. ICT News sat down with Oglala Lakota citizen and founder of the Disability Summit, Jim Warren, at last year's event. He shared with us the evolution of how the conference started. And at that first talking circle, it was just a few of us at the, in the room, but there were some key people there, I feel, that really had the heart and the desire to make something different for our people. We heard from some of the Unchis, the grandmothers, and some of the community members there going, we need to be able to gather to tell our stories and share our stories with the service providers. So that's when we started thinking, well, we should do a conference or some sort, and then the summit came up. The American Indian Disability Summit is a hybrid event, so if you can't make it in person, you can still attend virtually. For more information, go to their Facebook page at AI Disabilities Summit. Well, conference natives are gearing up for another major event happening next week. The Indian Gaming Association is hosting its trade show and convention in San Diego, California. The four-day event starts March 27th and ends March 30th. Entering its 37th year, it is the longest-running event of its kind. The trade show will host hundreds of speakers, exhibitors, and educational workshops. IGA brings together the largest gathering of tribal leaders and casino executives in the country. ICT will be there to bring you daily coverage and insight on the gaming industry landscape. Join us for our special coverage of the Indian Gaming Trade Show beginning Monday. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Ryan Reddington is Iditarod royalty. His father, Ramey Reddington, competed in the grueling sled dog race from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska 14 times. His grandfather, Joe Reddington Sr., was the co-founder of the contest back in 1973. This year, Ryan became the first in his family to win the race and topped an all-Alaska native podium, with both the second place and third place finishers also being Alaska native. Ryan, it's great to have you on welcome. Thank you. So you're now the Iditarod champion. Congratulations to you. What has the last week been like for you? Yeah, it's been very, very amazing. It was, we had a tremendous race coming into Nome. Like you said, we had a really good battle with Richie um, Deal and Pete Kaiser and both Alaska native mushers and, and, uh, the last few days racing um, in Eskimo country and, and all the beautiful scenery and uh, all the all the people along the way and the, the large amount of people in Nome and the celebrations afterwards, it's been a, a dream of mine to finally came true. Your grandfather helped found this race and he's known actually as the father of the Iditarod. What, would you, what do you think he would say if he was still here to see you win the event? I think you say very good. I'm very proud of you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, first place gets a 90 pound bronze statue of my grandpa. And that that's always been my dream. It's to take home that trophy. And I'm really excited to bring home that trophy to the family and to my, my town of Kinnick here. As I mentioned earlier, uh, all of the podiums there were all Alaska Native finishers. Um, tell us what that was like to sort of share that moment with other indigenous people. It's very special and it's, um, like I said, Richie and Pete are great, great competitors, great sportsmanship, and, and we're all very proud to, to uh, be Alaska Native mushers and to represent us well in the, in the, in the Iditarod and in uh, the Native communities that we pass through along the way. We're so supportive and so happy and so proud. And I'm proud to be Eskimo and very, very excited for, for the native communities. 
I actually would like to talk more about the journey that you had because you quite literally traveled across the state of Alaska. Um, tell us more about those Alaska Native communities that you passed and maybe how you were kind of mentally keeping um, a good mind throughout the race. Yeah, when when we arrive at the villages along the way, the, the Native communities, um, the every person from the entire village will come out and cheer on the dogs and the mushers and they were so excited and and it felt different this year with us three leading leading the race and it's uh it helped keep me in in the race it, their excitement and their cheering and it was very supportive and greatly appreciated and i'm just so so thrilled to what win the race for for the Alaska Native community and the Reddington family and and so proud of my dogs. I want to actually talk more about your dogs. Tell us about the leaders, uh, Ghost and Sven. Yeah, Ghost is six years old. She's finished the last four I did rods with me and in lead and um, just an amazing, amazing dog, super smart, Jean Ha and um, I'm so excited for her to be a champion and Sven as well. Sven is four years old and it's his first Iditarod finish and he both both lead dogs were outstanding throughout the race and and there was times where Ghost near the end of the race she was jumping all four feet off the ground with just a couple miles to go. She She knew where the finish line was and she was so so, so, such an amazing competitor and very, very honored to have her on my team. I wonder how do you sleep or eat or rest over the eight days that it took you to cross the state? Yeah, we, we run about seven hours and rest about four hours. That was my schedule. And I would, uh, I, I would get about 30 to 35 minutes of sleep each time that I would stop and, and, um, uh, I'd eat, I'd eat, um, vacuum sealed my, we vacuum sealed my meals before the race and I just drop it in the hot water when it was heating up to thaw the food for the dogs. And, and, um, uh, and it was tunnel vision trying to get all of my chores done as quickly as possible. And then to, the more quickly I got my chores done, the, the more minutes I could sleep. Are there any other Reddingtons who are coming along in this sport? Yeah, yeah. My niece and nephew both race in the junior I did rod, and this year my niece Ellen finished third in the junior I did rod, and my nephew Isaac finished fifth, and he won rookie of the year in the junior I did rod. It's a 150 mile race for 14 to 17 year olds, and my my kids, my daughter Eve Eve Violet and my son Thomas Joseph, they both raced this year in a race in Minnesota, and they've been they're very doggy kids, and I hope they carry on the family tradition. Ryan, I want to squeeze one last question in here. Uh, when you won the Iditarod, so many indigenous people, not only in Alaska, but around the world, uh, were really celebrating and cheering you on. What message do you have for all of the people who are really proud of your accomplishment? Thank you so much. And and I, I, I just, like I said, I'm proud to be, be um, Eskimo and I'm proud, proud of um, of our race and I'm, I'm excited in the next couple of weeks, we're going to several villages along the way, um, and, uh, Eskimo villages. And we're excited to talk, talk to the schools and, and, uh, and connect with, 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 uh, our native communities along the, uh, along, um, throughout Alaska and, and I, I thank everybody so much for their excitement and their cheering along the way. And, and I'm, I'm uh, super, super pumped up to come back and, and um, try to win this race again for all of us. Well, Ryan Reddington, the 2023 I Did a Rod winner. Thank you so much. Thank you. From one impressive athlete to another, a Hopi and Navajo runner came in as the top American in the 38th 
LA Marathon last weekend. Joseba Kretzman came in sixth place out of nearly 22,000 runners. This was his debut running in his first marathon ever. He finished the 26.2 mile course in just over two hours and 19 minutes. Joseba Kretzman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having, having me. Loboma uh, Yate, everyone on the Hopi Nation and Navajo Nation. So happy to be here. I have to start off by saying congratulations to you on this huge accomplishment. As I previously mentioned, this was your first marathon. What motivated you to participate in the LA Marathon this year? Yeah, it just seemed like perfect timing for me in the sense that my training has been going good. You know, my coach and I have been really working up to having me run a first marathon because prior to this, I've only done half marathons. So it was just a matter of let's get used to the marathon. Let's just see how it feels. Um, and let's just see how you do. And so it was as simple as that. And then the second goal, of course, was just to try and qualify for the Olympic trials, which has been a goal of mine since I was a little kid. So um, it was just amazing that a lot of that came together at the right time. And, um, you know, I was happy enough that the LA Marathon uh, race officials and race directors let me in into the elite race because sometimes it's hard um, to get into those elite races because they fill up pretty fast. So I was honored to be um, you know, one of the few elite and professional runners there. Tell us more about your background as a runner and what your expectations were going into this race. Uh, yeah, so my background in running, you know, I've started running when I was a little kid, mainly just running to school, running back home. Um, and I grew up in, in Hopeville, so, you know, a lot of running is embedded into my community and, and my culture and our ceremonies and a lot of our traditions as well. And so, yeah, I, I had to move off the reservation when I was around five and went to um, move to Flagstaff and continued running, you know, and then it wasn't until I got into high school and I went to Prescott High School in Prescott, Arizona, where I really started competing at, at you know, going to meets and, you know, just running in, in a competitive aspect instead of just more so just to, you know, just more so and just the spiritual side and, and physical side of, of running that really helps me. So it was neat to, to have that experience. And then it it even continued further when I got into college because, um, you know, I got accepted into um, at Fort Lewis College and uh, the coach there really took a chance on me and was just like, you know, I, I see that you've been training a lot and training alone. I don't have an official team that I was training for prior to that. And so it was just neat that that worked out. And, you know, I, I got to run on a collegiate team that was D2 and uh, made some good uh, achievements there. Actually, I'd love to learn more about the LA Marathon because you were averaging a five minute, 20 second mile. Was it an easy cruise for you or was there ever a point where you felt like this was getting really difficult? Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, it didn't get tough until probably mile 20. And, you know, I had six miles left pretty much. So that's when it got really tough. And that's when my my body was just kind of like, OK, we either got to keep going or, you're, you know, you might you might have to <laughs> drop out. But, you know, one thing that I've learned and one thing that's really kept me going um, is just my community. And, you know, there's this word that we say um, when we run or when we do races or, you know, before and after um, it's it's a word that's nahomvita, and nahomvita means to keep going, to push to your fullest, to give it your all. And so, in that last stretch, I really tried to embed that nahomvita, um, you know, the homvita meaning, and really just go for it, and just you know, not stop. And you know, that race is such a long race that, you know, you have a lot of doubts come into your mind. Like, even when I was at the start line, I was thinking to myself, like, why am I here? Like, you know, it's more so in why am I here in the sense that, like, I, I just felt like I shouldn't be there. And a lot of those races, I feel like that. Um, and it isn't until the gun goes off that I realize that, like, I'm, I'm right where I need to be. Um, so yeah, it was a really emotional race. Um, 
I, I can feel the emotion, and of course, we're joining one another virtually, but I, I think uh, for so many people who know Hopi and they know the runners, uh, it is something that you grow up with, at least from what I've observed on the outside looking in. I do want to actually talk about the um, iconic Olympic runner, uh, Louis the Wanima. How much was he, you know, um, someone you were thinking about or want to emulate? Uh, I thought about him the whole way. Um... I thought about him the whole way, and uh, it, it's really meaningful to have someone to uh, look up to like that in my community. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I I um I didn't think I was gonna cry this much. Um, it just really means a lot to me that I was there and got to got to do this and experience this because. Yeah, Hopi, Hopi and, and the Navajo Nation doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, and it's unfortunate because a, a lot of attention that we do get, it's it's um, it's usually things that that are, you know, negative in the sense that, you know, from from health, from, you know, COVID that we just survived through um, through diabetes, through, um, you know, low graduation rates. Um, it just means a lot that I'm here and that I'm I'm really trying to do the best that, that I can and really represent my community. Well, Joseva Kretzman, the Hopi runner who came in first place uh, for the men in the LA Marathon, we thank you so much and we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you, thank you so much. Water rights were the topic of discussion in the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday. The case before the high court is called Arizona v. Navajo Nation. Holly cook Macaro is an ICT regular contributor and partner with Spirit Rock Consulting. She is also a board member of Indige Public Media, the parent company that owns ICT and the ICT newscast. Hi, Holly. Hi, Alia. It's good to see you. Uh, let's just jump right in here. Tell us about this case and, uh, you know, what people are taking away from it, given that it's been a few days since oral arguments were heard. You know, I think there have been a number of reactions. It's a closely watched case, one, simply because it's dealing with Indian country. And as we all know, this is it's it's always risky to take a case in front of the Supreme Court for us and maybe more now so than ever. Um, if you look at, it, there's if one would like to review the the oral arguments, uh, there's an opportunity at SCOTUS blog. There's lots of coverage as well. But this case is not about whether the um, Navajo Nation has rights to the water in the Colorado River. That is agreed to and established, agreed to by, by both sides. But interestingly, what the federal government's responsibility is in protecting and reserving those rights. And I think it really highlights a conflicting position that the federal government occasionally finds themselves on, which is both sides of the table, either in a negotiation or on behalf of or against tribes. And uh, we see that front and center here. So this water rights case is really um, an excellent example of this dual role and uh, sometimes conflicting role that the federal government plays as our trustee. So I think there are there is the potential for far reaching consequences and um, all eyes are going to be on this as the Supreme Court considers this. Speaking about conflicting sides that the federal government is sometimes on, I want to switch gears and talk about the Willow Project. Last week, we had our Republican pundit, uh, John Tasuda on to give his reaction. And given that you're our Democratic pundit, I want to give you the opportunity to respond, given that you've worked both for the federal government and I've seen you advocate on behalf of climate change um, policies. Yes, I, th I think the big question right now is, you know, what is next for the Willow Project? Um, I, I really of no surprise to anyone in controversial projects like this, uh, litigation was filed the next day. And uh, a coalition called Trustees for Alaska, which is made up of some environmental justice and indigenous groups, uh, filed that litigation, uh, specifically calling um, on the U.S. District Court to abandon and or take another look at the, the decision because it failed to consider the project's direct and indirect climate risks. 
as well as harm to uh, the, the, the polar bears in the area and some other hunting, um, subsistence hunting for the indigenous people there. And um, I, I want to point to a piece that that um, we at Indian Country today ran just a few days before the decision came out by Jade Begay at Indian Collective, because I think it really pointed out what is at stake for tribes here. When we see these and those folks um, like my like my friend John Tasuda on the other side, and they point out, you know, the number of jobs that that this will this project will provide and um, and how much money it will bring to the region. But when, in fact, ConocoPhillips just last year alone made over one billion dollars, and uh, one of the, vill the, uh, the village closest there, they received have received six hundred thousand dollars over the last decade. And so, who is going to live with the long-term impacts of things like the flares, all of the impacts on the climate that uh, really I don't think are taken into account when we just talk about the jobs? Not that I don't mean to minimize the importance of employment and, that, and the kind of revenue that brings to our families um, in the Alaska Native communities. But all of those things um, in, in the universe of being considered, uh, I think are are going to probably delay this project just a bit. Holly, we've run out of time here today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Aaliyah. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.